Hi, I'm James Robinson, and this is my stock pick of the week. This video is about oil dry and its operations. Uh, I define operations as the economy and efficiency with which the company is able to deliver goods and services to their customers. The first thing that I look at when analyzing a company's efficiency is their gross margins. Gross margins are simply the costs, it's uh, the revenues minus the cost of goods sold. And um, so the thing about this company's gross margins are, if you look at it, they're sort of slightly above my minimum acceptable level of gross margins. So you know when you see that there must be something else going on with this company that I really like beyond its gross margins. Uh, I would say the company is adequate. Their, their gross margins are very, very consistent over a long period of time. They're very, very consistent throughout all different kinds of economies. Um, I consider this, a comp this company to be one with a high moat, uh, one that is in a very niche market where they're not going to get a lot of um, competition, a company that is very, re um, very resistant to recession, which are some of the reasons that I'm interested in. I also think the earnings are very, very predictable and that the price for the stock is currently very low relative to its attributes. So while generally I consider gross margins to be a key driver of why I would buy a company and uh, often I will disqualify a company just because the, low, the margin, gross margins are low, uh, in this case, the gross margins are sort of adequate and barely adequate, but it's the rest of the facets of this company that make it so interesting to me. In looking at the earnings, you can see why I have been, one of the reasons why I've been forgiving of the company's relatively narrow gross margins. Uh, this company's done a very good job of growing their earnings over time. Um, the earnings, and normally I look at a company's earnings and I look at the earnings per share. Oftentimes the company's buying back enough shares that the earnings per share are growing up disproportionately to the earnings. In this case, that's not the case. The company's uh, shares have been uh, pretty flat. But you can see that in 2004, for the first time, the company passed the $5 million in earnings point. Uh, today, they're at about $18 million, and that's in 15 years. So tripling in 15 years is is very, very good. It's something that I will uh, that will always interest me in a company, especially one where I think that is not happening as a result of some you know uh, technological advance where I think people are gonna come and usurp them. This is a company that's in a very, very stable industry. It's a small little niche business. People aren't flooding into the market or trying to compete with them. So they have some competitive advantages. Uh, they have some brands that I think are desirable. And so, you know, the earnings here are one of the reasons why I really like this company. Especially, I like the fact that this company's earnings have grown consistently, whether in a, you know, recession or, you know, a boom time. So uh, if you're like me and you think that this company's, this economy is going to have a hard time recovering from COVID in the mid to long term, um, then you say, hey, a company that's able to survive that is more and more desirable. I think the company's PE ratio is very low. And when you couple a very low PE ratio with an ability to grow earnings, you have an opportunity to really, really do very well. The reason, I don't often talk a lot about the net, this slide, which is um, net earnings as a percentage of revenue. And then the next slide is just looking at the chart of the actual net earnings and the net revenues. What you can see here, let's start with the slide net earnings and revenues. You can see that the net revenues of the company go up very consistently and very predictably year after year after year almost no matter what's going on. That's interesting because as an investor, I like being able to have, you know, to sleep at night and say, if I couldn't buy or sell this stock for 10 years, what would, what would likely happen with this company? And in this, in this case, over the last 20 years, you would see that the company is, you know, is doing very, very well and very, very consistently. Um, and so that's a fantastic attribute to have in a company, especially again, if you're able to buy it at a low PE. Uh, the actual, um, net earnings as a percentage of revenue. Again, it's very, very consistent. It's not great, but I've shown you that the earnings are able to grow despite the fact that this margin isn't very great. And that's just because it's a very consistent company. So a lot of the slides you're gonna see with this company as we go on, as we talk about it, are just gonna show the consistency. And if I'm getting that great consistency and I'm able to do it at what is today a low PE, then in time I would expect the PE to normalize and the stock to be a good earner and to for the price of the stock to go back up to normal as the economy recovers. This company has abnormally low selling and general administrative, general administrative costs. Uh, that's something that I, um, again, normally don't like. I, I consider that there are what I call four operating taxes. There is that you have to spend money and I like to see companies be very efficient in those categories because they're really siphons on earnings. 
this company is uh, selling general administrative is amongst the worst of the companies that I look at. However, the other three categories, so the four taxes are uh, selling and general administrative, plans and equipment, inventories, research and development, and then to a lesser extent, the fifth one, which is interest expense. Um, and you're gonna find that the selling general administrative is the kind of the outlier. It's the place where this company spends a lot of money. As I talk about in a lot of these videos, oftentimes company will be doing very well in three of these taxes and then have one tax that's very high. And I just sort of accept that that's the idiosyncrasies of that company. The best example of that is a pharmaceutical company. You're gonna see they spend a tremendous amount of money in R&D and they just, that's just the nature of that piece. So you just have to accept it if you're gonna invest in pharmaceutical companies. So uh, selling general administrative, not so great, but everything else balances that out. Uh, plants and equipment. Um, so this is a unique business because they're a vertical monopoly. They control every area of production and they own 8,000 acres of land that they do their mining. Well, when you're doing mining, you have a lot of equipment. In this case, even though they have all that mining equipment, and by the way, they also have plants on site where they process the clay that they use to make their product. And so despite the fact that they have what is typically a very uh, capital intensive business, a mining business and a, a factory for production of you know raw materials like, like raw earths, um, you're seeing that the this company is pretty efficient in the way they're handling their plants and equipment. They're in the top 25% of companies and that's competing with companies that have sort of none of that fundamental expense. So that actually is the kind of thing that makes me say, well, these com this company is at least in that category doing a pretty good job when they're able to compete with companies that don't have those fundamental and underlying costs. So he, the next category is inventory. I don't like companies that have a lot of inventory because inventory can be what I call a deferred loss. If you think about it, if Apple had a tremendous inventory of iPhone 12s and they were unable to sell them when the iPhone 13 comes out, then they're gonna eventually have to you know, really discount that product to give it away. And when that happens, sort of the inventory erodes in value. Uh, a worse example is a grocery store. They have tremendous inventories and some of that inventory, fruit and vegetables, for example, wastes away and becomes worthless. So when you see companies with high inventories, you have areas of high probable future losses. And that's one of the reasons why I consider inventory a tax. And it's a, I am much more interested in companies with no inventories than I am in companies with very high inventories. The caveat to that is companies where their product is very unlikely to spoil or to be replaced with a better product. And that basically means their cost of inventory uh, is simply the money lost in holding it, the cost, the opportunity cost, if you will, but their product is never gonna go bad. These guys, if these guys have a bunch of kitty litter that doesn't sell this quarter, next quarter they can sell that, kit, that kitty litter. It doesn't have a shelf life and it's not gonna be replaced with you know, kitty litter 2.0. So while this company has inventories, A, they're very, very consistent. So that's great. That shows me that they just sort of are where they figured out that they need to be. And second of all, I don't think there's any chance that this inventory is gonna waste away or that it's gonna be replaced with a better product. And then you have to throw that inventory away, thus creating losses. So I'm very, very comfortable with the inventory number. Uh, I don't mind, again, it, they're competing with a whole bunch of companies who by their very nature have no inventory. Uh, CBRE is a commercial real estate brokerage. They have no inventory. Um, good, all companies that provide services really have no inventory. So you're competing with those companies when you look at this chart that says that, you know, um, that, that a lot of companies just have no inventory. Um, so I'm great with the inventory. R&D, there is no R&D. Obviously, I'm very happy with that. So you can see that when you look at the inventory and you understand what's going on there and the fact that it's not, it's not um, going to go stale, and you look at the R&D and realize, well, there's no R&D cost, and you look at plants and equipment, and you see that's relatively low, and especially low when you know something about their business, you start saying, okay, in the four taxes, they got selling and general administrative, that's a lot higher than we'd like, but that's okay because these other three balance it out. So the next tax, and this is the one that is sort of self-inflicted tax, but it is still a tax, and it is something we should talk about, um, I don't like to see a company's interest expense be greater than about 15% of their operating income. And you can see that other than, you know, that a brief period in 2011 and 2010 and 2011, they've consistently been below that number. You can also see that that number is going down every year and it's currently something less than 5%. You say, okay, so interest expense is under control. They're doing a very good job in terms of managing your interest expense, which means that 
uh, that tax component and that operating component of that number is, is really negligible and something that gives you uh, reason to be uh, optimistic versus uh, pessimistic. Uh, so long story short, I don't consider the interest payment to this company to in any way be a problem uh, as an owner in terms of their inhibiting their ability to generate profits for the shareholders. So the last slide looked at net interest, uh, looked at interest expense, and that was simply the number of what, how many dollars did they pay in interest expense? There's a modifying number that which is net interest expense. If a company has a lot of money in the bank and they're earning income, dividend income or interest income from that, those, that money, uh, that can offset my interest expense and make it seem like it's less significant than it is, which is the case with this company. You can see that they, even though they have some interest expense, that number is offset by some interest income. And that's the kind of thing that, that you like to think about as you're analyzing a company's interest expense. So I've already shown that interest expense isn't really a problem, even looking at the, the actual number of interest ma payments made. But when you look at the modifying factor that's offset by some interest income, it's even less significant. So that tax is, is really non, a non-issue by any degree. So let's just go over a quick summary of operations. Um, so in terms of the companies I typically invest in, this company um, has above average operations, uh, but they're not spectacular. Um, if the rest of the characteristics were equal in quality of the operations, I wouldn't be an investor. What that means is that if uh, I'm okay with the way the company handles its operations, but it's not a key motivating factor for my buying the stock. I'm much more interested in the company because of its wealth creating characteristics and uh, because of the financial risk associated with it. And, and primarily when you look at those factors with the fact that the company's got a very low PE ratio and um, relative to the quality company that it is, I think it's just a good investment. I also like that this company is extremely, seems to be extremely predictable. They've been able to grow their earnings uh, consistently and solidly over a very long period of time through very diff very, various different types of economies. Um, the uh, operating characters of the company are gradually improving over the last 10 years versus eroding. That's a good sign. That means to me that they have some type of moat competitive advantage relative to their industry. And so again, that's a reason why I'm willing to overlook the only slightly better than average operating costs. The gross margins are acceptable. Uh, they're generally predictable. They're not very high, but we've talked about why that doesn't really bother me. Selling in general administrative is very high. Again, enough that under normal circumstances it would be disqualifying as an investment. But when you look at plants and equipment, which are relatively low, you look at the hidden gym that the, gem that the company owns, 8,000 acres of land that is free and clear, that has some value uh, when the company is mined it all out. Again, that, that land is gonna have some value. Uh, there's no inventories, general, general, I'm sorry, there's no, um, there vir virtually no inventories and inventories there are will never go stale and never have to be discounted. So I like that. Uh, there's no R&D cost and interest payments have been reducing every year for the last 10 years and are offset by interest income. So if you add all that up, you see that, you know, the company's operations are solid. They're improving. The earnings are proving, improving. And so you say, this company's got a great future. Why wouldn't I want to own this stock long term? Um, so I want to talk about three other things that don't have to do exactly with the stock. The first one is that um, if you want real time information when I buy and sell stocks, um, the way to get that information is to follow me on Twitter. My handle is at Robinson Stocks. Uh, oftentimes it takes me time to get around to making these videos. Unfortunately, I have a day job. I've got uh, you know eight year old twins and they take a lot of time. And this doesn't give me the bandwidth to make videos every day like I'd like, or certainly make videos the day I make trades. For example, I recently sold our position in Raytheon that we don't for a very short period of time, but we made about 27%. Um, and so if you'd like to know what I'm doing, when I do it, the best place to do that is on, is on Twitter. And again, my handle is at Robinson Stocks. You'll see those updates. Uh, you, you also will find news and thoughts on the market occasionally when I see something that's interesting. Secondly, I keep this map um, of where my followers are. It's really the only reward that I get for doing this, uh, which is that, you know, it just makes me feel good to, you know, when somebody from Moscow starts following me, which happened to me last week, or somebody from, you know, Sao Paulo or wherever. So if you enjoy these videos, um, then I would appreciate it if you would like, obviously everybody likes that or subscribe, uh, but just drop me a note in the comments that says, you know, hey, I'm from, you know, fill in the blank. I'm from Venice, Italy. I'd, I'd love to know where you're from it, it, and I'd love to add your dot to the map. Uh, finally, I've decided that I have a goal. I want to get to a thousand subscribers. Um, that goal is in part because it's a nice round number. In part, some of you may not know this, but 
when you reach a thousand subscribers, then YouTube will start paying you for your videos. I think it'd be pretty cool to get paid for these, obviously. Um, so I'm at 259 subscribers today, and I'm gonna update this chart over time, and hopefully you can help me get to a thousand subscribers. I'd appreciate it. So that's it for the operations of the company. I really appreciate it, and uh, thanks for your time.